Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this is our first in a three-part webinar series uh, regarding Veritas Net Backup. Uh, today's topic is new features of Net Backup 7.7 and 7.7.1. Uh, my name is Christian Muma. I'm the Data Protection Practice Lead for NetX. On the line, we also have MJ Johnson, who's our National Account Manager, as well as Angelo Shasha, who's our Vice President. Um, as, as we go, if you have any questions, please post them in the questions portion of the chat, and I'll, I'll periodically stop and address those. If your question doesn't get answered, uh, we're recording them all, so we'll answer any of them that I didn't answer live in the email that comes out following the presentation. If, if yours gets skipped over, however, please feel free to respond to that email, and we'll make sure that we get an answer to you. Um, before we get on to Net Backup, uh, I have just one slide to tell you a little bit about NetX and who we are. Um, we like to say that first we're an engineering company. Um, all of our practice leads have at least 10 years of consulting experience in uh, the various practices. Myself, I've um, been a Net Backup consultant um, for about 11 years now. Um, so that helps us have a, a rich understanding of the technologies that we sell as resellers. Um, and we use that knowledge to um, help our customers implement, architect, and, and design uh, their solutions. Um, currently, we have a single vendor for uh, each area that we provide coverage of. Uh, so that started out when I first started with NetX uh, earlier in 2015. Uh, Symantec was the single vendor that we were supporting. Naturally, with the Symantec and Veritas split, uh, that turned into two. And most recently, we're happy to announce that we now have a partnership with Pure Storage. So uh, we now support all three of those areas, and I, I think they work well together. Uh, most of our business right now comes from Veritas, um, but we still have plenty of business on the security side, and we've had some really positive wins uh, with Pure Storage. So with that, uh, we'll move on to today's topic. So today we'll be going over um, the highlights of the new features for NetBackup 7.7 .7 and 7.7.1. Uh, we'll be taking a look at the new user interface, um, intelligent policies that are now available for Microsoft SQL as well as Hyper-V. We'll take a look at the web client plugin for vCenter. Um, we'll take a look at VMware tags and how you can use those to assist with your VMware intelligent policies. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, Hyper-V plugin and more cloud connectors that are now available and how those cloud connectors can be faster with Amazon S3. Uh, finally, we'll take a look at Accelerator for NDMP, a few of the uh, more incremental updates with Linux, uh, the new Net Backup appliances, and some new Microsoft support. And finally, we'll wrap up with uh, Copilot for Oracle, which is a, a brand new feature that's really helping out um, with protecting Oracle databases. All right, so first, the new user interface. Um, they kind of wanted to make one GUI to rule them all. So you'll no longer have the Windows Administration Console available. Um, now everything is included in the Java Console, and it's a single installation for all versions of NetBackup. Um, it, it also provides some vast improvements. They've done a lot of work with the uh, Java Console. I think some of the complaints before uh, were that it was too slow and people didn't like using it. Uh, so we'll switch over to a demo here and take a look. So you can see in my start menu, if I drop down to Semantic Net Backup, there's a GUI for every supported version of Net Backup. We'll go ahead and launch the 7.7.1. So this single installation provides a GUI for all of those versions. Uh, the server happens to be 771. And most of the things in the GUI have stayed the same. There have been some 
improvements to the activity monitor as far as sorting and how you can organize the activity monitor. Um, you'll notice that now you can sort by multiple columns, whereas um, prior to that you can only sort by one column. There's also a little button here uh, where you can divide jobs by the parent job and then collapse and hide the child jobs after that. So there's some pretty useful features, um, but if you prefer not to use those, if you've been using NetBackup for a while and you're used to the, the way the GUI always has been, uh, you certainly don't need to. Uh, as far as performance of the new GUI, I saw a demonstration at the customer forum a few months ago, and they had a NetBackup uh, 7.6.1 server running, and with the GUI that com came with 7.6.1, uh, about 80,000 jobs were in the activity monitor and it took them five minutes to load. Uh, with this new GUI, they loaded the exact same activity monitor in about 10 seconds. Uh, so there was vast improvement there. Uh, one feature that I know folks liked quite a bit from the Windows administration console was the ability to filter. Um, and that was a little bit different than it was in the Java console, but now that's also been included in the Java console. And then the traditional Java console filtering is here as well. So that's uh, a few nice features with the GUI. Um, we'll swatch those. Next, we'll take a look at SQL intelligent policies. Most of us are familiar with intelligent policies for VMware. They were the first to be introduced. Uh, following that, last year came intelligent policies for Oracle, and they've now been introduced for SQL. So before intelligent policies, SQL backups were managed by batch files, where you had to explicitly specify each individual parameter of what you wanted to back up on that SQL server. Um, and I'll show an example of that. I have a SQL server here. And to create these batch files, we would launch the SQL GUI for net backup. And if you didn't want to edit it manually by hand, you could come through and select individual databases or you could select all databases. And one of the biggest drawbacks to this was you had to specify what type of backup you wanted for each individual file. So as each policy could only call one file, you had to have three different files for your full backup, your incremental backup, and your transaction log backup. And then once you selected what you wanted to backup, you could then save it. and it would look something like this. And most people came in and added or removed things or edited this file by hand. Um, if you look, we can see here's a tech note that shows all the different values and keywords that you can add to that file. So it wasn't extremely complicated, but in my opinion, it was unnecessarily complicated. And a lot of that complication has been alleviated now with intelligent policies. So that was the old way of doing things. And now we'll take a look at the new way. So the, in the new method, you register your SQL instances with NetBackup. And this can be done by a database admin. admin. So if they don't want to share the SA password or they don't want to provide credentials uh, for backups, they can actually put in the, uh, just type the credentials in the GUI themselves. Um, so here I have one instance registered named Home SQL. They also have provided uh, instance groups. So you can organize your SQL databases into groups and uh, help with policy creation and, and what you want to back up at what time during the night. So for this group, for this instance, I've added it to a SQL group. And then I can manage the credentials in the properties of the SQL group. 
All right, and now instead of a batch file, what we can do is create an intelligent policy. And the, the, the first tab looks the same. That's what we're used to with the attributes. Uh, for the schedules, you'll notice that now all the, the full incremental and the transaction logs are in the same policy. So that, that definitely removed quite a bit of clutter that we would have previously. Um, this is the tab that makes it an intelligent policy. And here you can select individual instances and entire instant groups. Or you, this last option is to use the traditional method with batch files. So you'll notice if I click new here, I only have one SQL group um, on the server, but this is where you could select one or more groups. If we wanted to uh, specify a certain instance, that can be done uh, with this radio button. And then you can actually go down to the individual database level. All right, but for now, I'll change that back to my SQL group. In backup selections, I would say 99% of uh, NetBackup customers will choose the whole database, uh, but you do have an, uh, an option to specify file groups or individual files. And then the last tab are all the configuration parameters that we saw in the tech note. So these are what would normally go into your batch file. They're all recorded in the policy properties, and the batch file is created on the fly at the time of the backup. So the number of backup stripes, um, how many backups you want to allow to run in parallel at the same time, which is basically how many jobs um, can run. Uh, this uh, Option at the bottom to convert differential backups to full backups is, is very safe to do uh, so that you're not accidentally taking incremental backups when you don't have a full uh, to rely on for recovery. And then in the same section are your options for transaction logs. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start this policy to give everyone an idea of how that runs. And I'll run a full backup. And then if we look in the activity monitor, it appears very similar to how it would look if we were using a batch file. There's one extra parent job here, which is the actual job on the master server that takes a look at the different instance groups and what's been discovered. And we'll hop back over to the SQL server. And if you look, this is the uh, test batch file that we created in the DB extension uh, directory for SQL. And you'll also find these other files that show the batch files that are created on the fly. So each time a backup job runs, it dynamically creates that file and uses it for that specific backup. In restores for SQL databases that are protected by intelligent policies are exactly the same as restores from the traditional method using batch files. So as you can see, intelligent policies take away the management, the need to manage all your various batch files and simplify things. I, I think that's a good tool to have to dissuade customers or, or DBAs from preferring to use dump files. Um, so we get a little efficiency there. All right. We'll switch back over. So there have been some improvements with Hyper-V backups. In NetBackup 7.7, um, Hyper-V intelligent policies were introduced. Uh, those are similar to VMware intelligent policies. Um, and System Center plugin was also introduced in version 7.7. .7. In version 7.7.1, um, integration of System Server Manager with the intelligent policies. So they, that's when they combined those two features so that you could use them together. Um, the advantages that we get from that 
are very similar to those that we get from intelligent policies for VMware. You can protect a VM across multiple failover clusters and nodes. So if a VM migrates from uh, one Hyper-V server to another in the cluster, the backup follows it. You don't have to specify which server the VM uh, resides on. And because of that behavior, it, it simplifies the configuration and um, requires a lot less level of effort to manage those backups. Um, it extended support for VMs under dynamic optimization. It discovers the VMs quickly. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a VMware uh, Hyper-V environment to demonstrate that, um, but it's about 4,000 VMs in a minute that it can discover, and I haven't really seen many Hyper-V environments with more than 4,000 VMs, although I suppose there's some out there. I, they added support for VMs and failover clusters on Windows 2008 R2, and you can now back up powered off VMs by referencing the host name. So we, we made some improvements there with Hyper-V. I'd say it's pretty much caught up to uh, where VM, VMware policies are. Another benefit that I don't have listed here, um, our resource constraints can now be used for Hyper-V like they are for VMware. So if you only want to allow a certain number of Hyper-V VMs to be backed up at any certain time, uh, you can set that limit here. So this will limit the number of active snapshots per server or per, per cluster, um, and then the number of operations per server and per cluster. So that helps out quite a bit managing a Hyper-V environment. Okay, next is the plugin for vCenter Web Client. So when vSphere 6.0 was introduced, they're trying to um, encourage everyone to move over to the Web Client plugin rather than the uh, vCenter GUI. Um, and NetBackup uh, provided support for that on day one. Um, I had some advantages that it provides. Uh, I would say the biggest ones are allowing uh, VMware administrators to get a good understanding of what's going on in the backup world. So now they can take a look at uh, their VMs through their native tool to see how backups are doing. Uh, it also allows uh, instant recovery of protected VMs through vCenter. So we'll take a look at that. Here I have the vSphere web client loaded in my test environment. Uh, probably the first thing you would notice is that there's now an option on the left for semantic net backup. And this is where we can go to initiate instant recovery or standard recovery of a virtual machine protected by net backup uh, without using the net backup client or net backup credentials. So if uh, VMware administrators wish to use the recovery wizard or instant recovery, they don't need to be managed through the credentials of NetBackup. Once you associate the vCenter and provide a, an encryption key, uh, NetBackup will authorize uh, communication and NetBackup actions. So we can take a look. I'll just pick one of the servers in here. and we'll run a search. It's one of my protected VMs, and through this GUI, I can go ahead and initiate uh, the restore in the instant recovery. But we'll back out of that for now. So another useful view in the vSphere web client is in the resource tree here, you can see that now under the monitor section, there's a semantic net backup tab. So if we go to the high level for vCenter, um, we get a nice dashboard of how many VMs are being protected, um, how many failures you can see. We have a failure here in red, 124 successful backups and 125 total with one failure. 
So a useful view here is listed under virtual machines. You can see each VM listed under that vCenter and when the last successful backup was. And more importantly, you can see backup failures or which VMs don't have a backup. So this server happens to be my master server and I'm not taking uh, vSphere backups of it. It's excluded. So it's listed here under the no backup information section. So that's pretty useful uh, features that they've added. All right. Moving on, VMware tags are now supported. With the introduction of vSphere 6, uh, custom VMware attributes are no longer supported. Instead of custom attributes, um, VMware released what they're calling VMware tags. So any intelligent policies that previously used custom attributes would now need to be switched over to tags, which I, I think standardizes things a little bit and, and actually makes more sense as a backup administrator. So to tag a VM, just right click on it and you can see here there's an assign tag or a remove tag option. So for this server, HomeWin1, we can add a tag. I only have one tag created in here for Linux hosts. Um, so we'll create a new tag. And then we'll call it Windows for Windows hosts. like Flash has given me in here. So we'll pop out of this. I do have one host, or actually two hosts that have a Linux tab. Right, bear with me one moment. Looks like we have a question while this is reloading. Does that backup delete those automatically general generated SQL backup scripts? Uh, yes, they do. Um, it's not after the backup completes, but it's over a period of time. Uh, so you could see in the example server I had, I think there was probably 20 or a couple of dozen of them, um, but those backups have actually been running for months. So it, it does handle the, uh, the deletion and the caretaking in the background. Thanks for that question. All right, so it looks like my vSphere web client decided not to play nice. Try this again. Okay, so this home or one is an Oracle server and we'll assign it this Linux tab tag. And now if we switch back over to the net backup GUI, we'll go to a VMware policy select it through a query and for field we'll say tag contains Linux and we'll add that and then run a test for the query and it Selected home NBU01. I'll have to go back and see why that one failed. But I think that demonstrates the idea of tags and how you can use them in the query. Where I've seen a lot of customers successfully use VMware tags are simply to tag VMs that they want backed up as backup 
or they can add the time. So they can create a tag for 11 p.m., one for uh, 1 a.m., and one for 3 a.m. And then they, when they create their query, they'll uh, schedule that policy to coincide with those tags for when they want the VMs run. So it's a, it's a new way to sort of organize your VMs uh, and backup schedules. All right, the next feature we'll talk about are the cloud connectors. So prior to uh, version 7.7, .7, uh, there were three main cloud connectors. There were actually a couple more that came and went, but these three have been around since uh, NetBackup version 7.5. Uh, so there's AT&T that uses the EMC APIs. There's Rackspace that uses OpenStack Swift APIs. And then there's Amazon Cloud Connector that uses Amazon's own S3 APIs. S3 has sort of been adopted as a cloud storage standard. Um, so with that, we now have a few more um, cloud vendors providing uh, storage with the S3 connector. Uh, so here we see Verizon, uh, Amazon GovCloud, Hitachi, Google, and Cloudian. With S3, you get a few more benefits um, that were taken advantage of by NetBackup. Uh, one being that now parallel connections are allowed. The default is set to 100, although that is configurable and tunable. Uh, so now you'll be able to set up buffers and, and sort of um, configure and tune your cloud connections like you would, uh, like we did traditionally with tape drives. Uh, so of course, it's still highly dependent on your uh, ISP connection, uh, but it's nice that there are some tunables there. Um, also, the limit for each connection is one megabyte per second, uh, which is a, a, a nice increase and in, uh, fairly performant. With S3, we're also able to uh, target the same cloud bucket by multiple storage servers, uh, so this simplifies things quite a bit. Uh, if you have multiple media servers running in your environment, uh, they're now able to all point to the same cloud bucket. Um, this is useful uh, one use case that I've seen it, um, an example of it in is multi-tenant environments where um, a company is, is hosting several other smaller companies in their data center and their media servers are on segregated networks, but they're all able to securely back up to the cloud uh, to the same storage bucket whereas before they would have to maintain a different cloud account for each client. Okay, Accelerator for NDMP is another very useful new feature with NetBackup 7.7.1. Um, unfortunately, right now it's only been introduced for NetApp, um, but sometime in 2016, I th believe it should be sometime in the first half of this year, uh, support for Isilon will be available as well. Um, Accelerator for NDMP is the same um, thought process is accelerator for Windows or VMware, uh, where full backups only uh, transfer changed blocks. Um, so the first backup naturally um, cannot be accelerated because you need to seed all the information. Um, after that, the change block track is located on the media server and the master server. Um, that's because there's there is a deep integration with the file system on the NDMP devices, so it's up to net backup to main change to maintain that uh, change block track. However, it will migrate to a different media server if the backup moves to another media server. So if you have uh, load balanced or a failover uh, storage unit group and it, your backup, your media server goes down, the media server that starts the backup the next night will get the change block track from the master server. Um, also, unmodified files are skipped. Uh, so there's a, they built some efficiency into it as well. All right, take a look. Looks like we don't have any questions currently. Uh, there's a few uh, iterative changes or improvements. Um, one is the Linux MSDP size was increased to 96 terabytes. Uh, prior to that, it was uh, 64. Uh, more memory is still required. Uh, so if you do 
upgrade your storage pool or increase your storage pool in version 7.7.1, make sure that you still have enough memory for the new increased size. The rule of thumb has always kind of been one gigabyte of memory per terabyte of storage space. Um, next are uh, incremental improvements for the NetBackup 5330 appliances. Um, there's a capacity increase, a, a large capacity increase. They can now handle up to 458 terabytes. Uh, so if you currently, if you buy a new appliance, you can get two storage shelves, each holding 229 terabytes. Uh, previously, you could only get two storage shelves with 114 terabytes. If you did have that configuration before, you don't have to swap out the storage shelves. You are allowed to introduce an additional uh, third storage enclosure with 229 terabytes to bring you up to that 458. So that's 458 terabytes possible in 10 U's of rack space, which is uh, a vast improvement uh, that our, our competitors certainly can't achieve that density right now. Uh, there's uh, some additional support for Windows added. Um, incremental backups for system state are now available. Um, that's not something to cause dancing in the streets, but it is nice that you no longer have that you know, automatic few or dozen gigs um, backing up each night. Now system state can be backed up incrementally as well. Also, there's day one support for Microsoft Exchange Server uh, 2016. Okay, so one of the biggest features and most anticipated uh, with NetBackup 771 is Copilot, an accelerator for Oracle. Uh, this introduced new ways to accommodate Oracle backups. Uh, Copilot basically runs on a NetBackup appliance. Um, so with that, you can use an appliance for your standard backups and share a pool of that disk for Copilot. Um, because there's Copilot, Oracle Intelligent Policies, um, in, in the traditional ways of backing up Oracle. Now we can really find uh, whether we want to optimize performance or efficiency of storage. Um, there's, there's a lot more options out there now. Um, and with a Copilot comes Accelerator for Oracle, so like any other Accelerator method, um, you can back up the database once and then create a change block track in just backup incremental uh, backups of change blocks only. And then in the background, a uh, full database backup will be synthesized. Uh, it's similar to doing synthetic backups or, um, or accelerator backups for Windows and Linux. Also, all of these methods now maintain deep integration with Oracle. Uh, so they talk back and forth with the RMAN catalog and the RMAN catalog I uh, can still do cross checks. Uh, so we'll go a little bit more into Copilot and how that's uh, quite a bit different than, than how we're used to backing up Oracle with the net backup agent. So traditionally, uh, we would see database admins that would dump an Oracle backup to disk and either store that disk locally on the Oracle server or move it to a NAS device. Um, or somewhere else in the environment that was allocated specifically for that purpose. There were a lot of disadvantages to that. Um, one, when the backup software would come along and sweep it up and delete it, the Oracle admin no longer had access to it. Uh, so the Oracle admin would control his own restores but would rely on the backup admin to provide the data. Um, it also creates a heavy load. So because that uh, space doesn't have enough for several days worth of backups, uh, typically we would see uh, DBAs do nightly full backup database dumps, um, which puts a lot of processing on the Oracle server itself and can eat up quite a few resources, and as well as take a long time. Um, then once the dump is moved to disk or NAS, um, it has to be swept up by the backup software. So it's two hops that that information is now making. Uh, so your network resources fall under a constraint as well. And the disadvantages to this for the backup admin 
the biggest one, in, in my opinion, is that the backup admin can't verify that what he's backing up is a consistent copy of the Oracle database or that it's even a restorable copy of the Oracle database. If the Oracle dump is going on as the file system backup occurs, uh, then obviously that would get an incomplete copy. Um, and the backup admin, the backup software doesn't know what's in that backup set because there's no integration with RMAN uh, when you use this method, the traditional method of uh, dump and sweep. Um, also, the backup admin can't customize his policies specific to uh, the database or what's on the database. So what's different now with Copilot, um, basically the way Copilot works is the net backup appliance would provide an NFS share and the database admin can then either initiate his own database dumps to that NFS share or they can be scheduled through a net backup policy and the net backup APIs can talk to Oracle and, and schedule a database dump. So from that dump on the NFS share and net backup, the backup can then be duplicated through SLPs to either a, a, a deduplicated disk pool or an advanced disk pool, or you can spin them off the tape or any of the other um, operations that we would perform with an SLP, Ob obviously replications in there as well. Um, so this provides several advantages. Um, so first we'll start with the database admin. He's able to see and use all of the copies of that database dump. So it's not like it went to a dark pool and got removed by backup software or some third party processing. Uh, the DBA is now aware of where he can retrieve that those backups from. It also reduces load on the database server because it, it no longer needs to do nightly full database dumps. Um, and because they're no longer nightly full dumps, uh, they, they operate much faster. This is also where you can use um, Accelerator for Oracle. So the advantages for the backup admin are now the backup admin is aware of all the database operations. So he doesn't have to guess or hope that his backups are happening after the database operations are completed. Um, and because the backup admin can schedule Copilot backups through Net Backup, he can he can create policies that are tailored to the specific needs of the environment, and he's aware of uh, all the backup, the entire backup process from beginning to end. All right, um, so that's Copilot in a nutshell. It looks like we have uh, a few more questions here. So we'll take a look at those. Um, will we have a webinar demo for the Copilot later? Yes, we will. Um, so I, I guess I should say at this time, uh, on the same email that you get the registration link for this webinar, uh, we have Thursday a webinar for uh, the 5330 appliance where we go into the features of that a little bit more. And then next Tuesday, a week from today, we're also having an another webinar on intelligent policies. And we go a bit more into um, intelligent policies for SQL, Oracle, and VMware. And let's see. Does the issue of the change block file becoming large get addressed in 7.7? Um, Let's see, Charles, I'm not sure if you're talking about specifically for Oracle or for file system backups. Um, for the Oracle backups, I'm, I'm not sure if there's an issue with those getting um, becoming too large or for NDMP for that matter. I know that NDMP, they reside on the media server. Um, so I, as the backup admin from our perspective, we should be able to keep an eye um, on space for that. But I'll take note of your question and, uh, and send you an email um, later on this week. Let's see, question number two, will Copilot work with OST backup appliances besides the net backup appliance? No, because it needs the functionality of being able to present the NFS share. 
I, I don't believe it's supported for any other OST appliances at this time. We, we did see, however, um, accelerator and synthetic backups and, and things like that came out for the data domains and the, the quantums. Um, I think it was probably like 18 months to two years after they were introduced on the net backup appliances. So I, I don't work for Veritas and, and don't want to pretend to speak for them, um, but I would imagine it, it may be coming out soon. Let's see, is Copilot limited to the net backup appliance? Yeah, so that's kind of what um, what we were just talking about there. I believe at this point it is um, only for the net backup appliance. All right, if anybody else has some questions, now's the time to get them in there. Uh, let's see. Charles, so you were talking about for file system backups. Um, I don't know if they've made any improvements to that. Um, I I didn't really see that problem that widespread, although I know that um, a few of our customers were having it, where the, the CBT would just eat up too much file system. I believe it was on Windows. Um, so I, I can take a look and see um, see if they've made improvements to that. All right, I don't see any other questions in here. Oh, we got one more. Um, no, I don't know of any improvements or any alterations to um, DFSR backups. Um, but I will note that one down, and I'll grab your um, your email address out of the invite and, and send you any information I find on that. All right, so it looks like we're about the 45-minute mark. I'll go ahead and, and wrap things up. Like I said, if for some reason I missed your question in the questions box or if, if you think of anything else, please reply to the email that comes out after the uh, webinar. We, we send a blast afterwards, and um, please feel free to reply to that, and we'll definitely get back to you. Um, like I said as well, there's the uh, Thursday. Uh, we have the webinar for the 5330 appliance. And then the following Tuesday, a week from today, we'll have another webinar uh, going into a little bit more detail on the um, intelligent policies for Oracle, SQL, and VMware. And uh, we have examples. I, I um, run through my lab environment for that as well. So if you're not familiar with those, it's a good opportunity um, to kind of see what they're about and if they can help out in your environment. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining today, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.